This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We're here every Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern Time, 12 to 3 Pacific. And, of course, uh, on in Wisconsin from 7 to 10 Central on 92.7 FM. Monday through Friday uh, there in the great Badger State. Uh, our next guest comes to us from the 206. Uh, it's, of course, Seattle, Washington. That is, of course, where we find our uh, longtime contributor. He, of course, uh, is a great journalist, Democracy Watch News, a uh, great musician. Check him out, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield. And, uh, of course, he is a contributor to the Jeff Santo Show on Fridays. Great to have uh, MTC with us. Uh, happy Friday, Mark. How are you, sir? Well, we're in the studio uh, (laughs) playing music as usual, playing a really loud guitar. But uh, I'm a little sleep deprived. I wrote an article for the Seattle Star, and I, you know, I really don't talk about them enough. But I've been writing for them pretty consistently over the last few years. And my friend Omar Wiley is the editor. They have some really cutting edge, good political arts and culture stuff going on uh, at that site. So. And I was writing about Northwest culture and Northwest seafood and things like that, some of the things I've talked to you about, because I was wondering about what Boston had in terms of chowder, because we have some of the best around here. Right, um, yeah, then, chowder, chowder in Boston, uh, as they pronounce it, is uh, is the best in the world. Nothing, you know, nothing like that red stuff in, in Manhattan, by the way. Uh, yeah. So all, all those New Yorkers, you know, they can take their chowder. Um, but, uh, no, uh, we get the best. I, I, I have not had anything but the great salmon which is the best in the world when i was in seattle so i'm looking forward to having more salmon when i go back but the chowder could be good i would say you know maybe you can come in second place (laughs) good seafood wherever you can get it is always a good thing you know it was great growing up in the northwest and being able to go out on my father's boat and we would harvest fresh clams and oysters and fish for salmon it was pretty idyllic way to, to live you know so I'm in the studio right now because I'm getting ready to release a song, and it's going to be out on all the major platforms, Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music and all that. So we're we're going big time. But that's where the, the music industry is now. You know, in order to make money, since the clubs aren't really opening uh, yet, it's, uh, although there is a show at the Showbox coming up next month, but most of us are, are streaming our music live on these platforms that are or sometimes doing live streaming, but mostly people are downloading the songs, and that's how the musicians are making money. But Governor yeah. Inslee just announced yesterday that we're headed to Phase 3 in all of the Washington counties as of March 22nd. So that means that the Mariners will actually be able to have, I think, 9,000 people or something, which is actually only 25% of the capacity um, at the at the baseball field. But... It, things are looking up. If they can keep the, the vaccines uh, supply going here, it's, it's been hard for some people to get them. But if they can keep things going in the right direction, then, heck, you know, by by May, we might actually be starting to get high school sports back and other, other sporting events, at least outdoors. Yeah, let me, let me ask you about that, Mark, because this has uh, been a topic of conversations that uh, we've been having over the last couple of days with our contributors and callers. I I am um, happy as a sports fan, as a mu- as a fan of music and live concerts. Uh, you know that we're moving in that direction, but uh, the idea of opening up as they are in Texas uh, with a hundred percent capacity for probably just one game, uh, I guess that's what somebody is is reporting. Uh, they may go back to a, a, a smaller number. That's that's kind of crazy, and we need to stop these super spreader events. I know spring break in Florida is uh, is seemingly you know back to normal. You know where you can't get a hotel or a flight. Uh, you know into Florida. I mean, I understand that we need to get sort of back to normal, and for people who have been cooped up, uh, you know, it, it can be really hard. But, I mean, we, we are asking for trouble. I mean, I would love to come out and, and visit you in, in Seattle, but, you know, I don't want to do it if we get a lot of people who are not going to be vaccinated, people who are lunatic right from uh, in Trump land, you know, who don't believe in vaccines, so don't wear, don't believe in, in, in wearing masks. To me, that's really concerning. I don't, I'm not sure where Inslee is on all of this. I know he, he wants to open up like a lot of governors do. But what are the concerns? I don't know how you feel about this as somebody who wants to perform in front of a live audience. But 
at the same time, you know, you need to be concerning. And I think for most people, unless you're in, you know, certain categories of, uh, you know, the, those uh, first responders, those uh, who are emergency workers, uh, people like myself who are, uh, you know, caregivers, uh, you know, to, to older uh, parents and grandparents, outside of them, you're going to have to wait until May 1st. So I hate to see you you know, go on stage without a vaccine, unless you can get one before then, of course. Well, as of March 17th, the the, the estimate is that uh, high-risk critical workers in industries like agriculture, uh, fishing, uh, boat crews, food processing, grocery store and food bank workers, uh, c- correctional facility workers, uh, people who work in the courts, public transit, and all the rest of the first responders are are going to be eligible. So they're going to get the first dibs. And then people 16 years or older who are pregnant or or who have a disability, that puts them at high risk. So uh, we, we still have a ways to go. And I, just to be clear, large outdoor venues with permanent seating uh, will be able to, as of, if things go as planned, and there'll be, there'll be updates on this as things go, and they'll be monitoring it, but... As of next month, generally large outdoor venues with permanent seating can have fans at 25% capacity or up to 9,000 people in the case of the Mariners. Um, and then events in indoor and outdoor facilities are capped at 50%, and you can't have more than you know 400 people at an event. But I am like, I'll be honest with you, Jeff, I'm in the studio working on music, um, why I'm not getting any sleep. And... I am not rehearsing with my band right now because we're all still kind of waiting for more people to get vaccinated and for members of the band to get vaccinated before we actually decide to start spending a lot of time together and working on this music for live shows. Now, they're learning the songs, and you know I'm sending them the new songs as I get the rough mixers ready just so that they can learn them. But uh, we're still on a wait-and-see attitude as far as the band is concerned we haven't booked any shows yet it's a kind of a wait and see attitude that i have and that the folks in the band have so when the vaccination rate gets up there um to the point where the majority of people have have been vaccinated then i'll be much more willing to be out in public and doing public events but until then i'm staying pretty pretty much and doing my outdoor activities as usual, the boating and the hiking and biking and all that kind of thing. Um, but with just a couple of friends at a time, and, you know, I went with a friend down to Myrtle Edwards Park the other day. We went to the beach down on Elliott Bay. It was really beautiful. But we're, we're still kind of all keeping social distance and wearing masks and waiting for the vaccination rate to, to increase. There's been a shortage here. And it's not just here. We had a discussion at Democracy Watch News and during our press briefing about this. And all of the, our, our correspondents checked in from across the country. And there's been a, a lack of availability in certain parts of the country. And Seattle, unfortunately, is one of those places. I'm still yeah. in a wait and see attitude, Jeff. Well, it's going to be fascinating to see how this uh, whole thing transpires. We're talking with our good friend, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, the Renaissance Man of the Jeff Santos Show. We'll uh, take your calls coming up at 772-223-2362 in, uh, in a couple of minutes. I want to get back uh, to uh, to the music scene. Uh, you know, the Grammys are coming up this weekend, I think Sunday night. Uh, it, 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 you know, it used to be a big deal. I think, uh, it was maybe 10 years ago when Jennifer Lopez had the, had the, had the famous dress and so on and so forth. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you sense that the industry itself ha- has sort of lost some of its soul. It, the industry, not so much music. There's still great music. You make it, uh, out there. And, and there, there are other artists, of course. But where do you think it is from a, the fact of of the big wheeler dealers and the corporate uh, media and the, and the corporate you know the the uh, the record companies and so forth. Uh, your view from your your platform. We have a group, uh, a female group called Sajay. I think is how it's pronounced. S A J E, and they are actually nominated for a twenty twenty one Grammy Award. So we do have a Seattle connection at this point, but they're more known for their sort of jazz type type of stuff so 
Um, but we're proud of them, and we're proud of folks like Brandy Carlisle, the famous singer-songwriter that also has won a Grammy Award. And then, you know, you have all the folks like Eddie Vedder, who actually won a Grammy Award for his uh, solo album featuring his ukulele, which was mind-blowing to me, considering how loud their band is. And then suddenly, I should have known, though, because I saw him open for the for a Ralph Nader event at the Labor Temple in Seattle, that building has an incredible amount of history, but we can talk about that another time. It's the headquarters for the King County Labor Council, but Eddie Vedder opened for a Ralph Nader event playing his ukulele and sang a song about Bill Gates, and I, I was just blown away that he was so much into that little instrument. But, you know, we're all watching it, and we're all curious about the music industry, but it is a different world now, um, and things have really kind of fragmented and fractured in a lot of ways. Uh, there's it's hard to tell exactly who is um, getting the most downloads and how people are actually getting their their music out there because there's so many platforms for distribution. It's really hard to keep track of it all. Um, so there's not one main or one small group of record labels sort of controlling the industry now. There's a lot of DIY going on, and that's something that I'm actually proposing for a TED Talk up here is that the, the art of DIY, we've all, as musicians, had to learn how to record, produce, distribute, license our own stuff. And so when you look at the way that things used to be, uh, it's a whole new world out there. And there, there's more opportunities uh, for independent artists, I think, but, they, uh, but we still are beholden to major media outlets um, in terms of getting bands exposure, there are some bands here in Seattle that I've talked about a lot, like, you know, and, you know, they're my friends. So, you know, there you go. Of course, I got to speak up for them, but they are great bands. And I think they're the best in Seattle. One is called Bear Axe. And that's Shana Shepard, who was doing a, a performance with Kim, Kim Thale from Soundgarden as a tribute to Alice in Chains a few months ago, um, because they got a big award here from Mopop. Um, as our local heroes, the Alice in Chains, Chains group. And then there's also the Black Tones, and that's Evil and Cedric Walker uh, twins, actually, who do this incredible music and were getting national uh, attention and write-ups you know, from NB NPR and all sorts of stuff just before the lockdown happened and all the clubs closed. They were definitely on an upward uh, trajectory there with their careers. Some musicians who actually were very popular a year or two ago aren't playing music much at all. They aren't even really live streaming, which is one way that people are getting their music out there. I haven't done that much live streaming either. I feel like I'd rather spend that time in the studio recording the songs. If we're not going to be performing, then I'm kind of thinking, like, what would the Beatles do? They would go record Sgt. Pepper or something, right? Or the Moody Blues would do uh, Days of Future Past or something. Because now you have all this time that you can spend in the studio, indoors, working on the recording. So that's where I'm at. But soon, uh, I do very much miss live music, and I miss hanging out with my friends. I miss Shana and Eva and all the, the great bands in Seattle that were really fresh and innovative and new. I like the new sound in Seattle that I was hearing. It's very eclectic. And then some of it is, and some of my music actually is hearkening back to our roots and going back to blues and R and B and well, that's and that's that's, that's, that's a great great big part of it. Hey, I want to I want to take you in, in in another direction as well, and that is, of course, Amazon is based in in your fair city, and uh, you know Joe Biden has uh, made it clear he wants to uh, see unions uh, organized down there in Alabama, which is uh, a great thing. Uh, I could definitely give him credit where credit is due. There's a lot of the things that I criticize him for, and he deserves it. But I I wonder what the local reaction is to this. Of course, you know, this is the same company that went after Mr. Sawant, probably more dollars that Amazon is putting to get rid of the uh, Social Democratic uh, City Councilor there. Where are we in terms of the reaction of, of trying to rein in the Goliath of Amazon? After the Seattle City Council rescinded its own vote after two weeks after they voted, to tax large corporations like Amazon and Seattle. They were able eventually, with the new cadre of progressives on the city council, they were able to get a, pro, uh, a more progressive uh, corporate tax passed in Seattle. So there's been some headway. But the new C CEO 
Andy Jassy is just as um, sort of fanatically libertarian as Bezos in terms of a, a lack of sense of responsibility to the community where they're doing business. And so that doesn't hearken well for the future of relationships with Amazon and the city. They have failed to be a good community partner at times, and they have failed to take responsibility for their own um, influence on the skyrocketing cost of real estate and therefore rents in the city, which has increased homelessness. They have definitely embarrassed themselves with the way that they treated the employees in Alabama. That, I mean, that's going back to... Uh, old strike breaker mentality where the the employees are treated like servants or something rather than than employees so i think there have been national solidarity rallies for the workers in alabama and seattle was one of those cities where that took place and i know that the ongoing battle between shama sawan the democratic socialist city council member and amazon has not cooled down at all. If anything, it's it's ramped up, and you can you definitely see more. We'll definitely see more of that. We are. It looks like going to get a capital gains tax in Washington State, which will help because regardless of our progressive politics, we've had the most regressive tax system in the entire country for years now, with no state income tax. So really wealthy people, the billionaires like Bezos and Paul Allen and. Bill Gates and, and Schultz, uh, they don't pay an income tax. And and most of them have said that they're willing to pay one, too. I mean, they realize, you know, this, the uber wealthy realize that, you know, they're getting away with an, an outrageous thing here in the state. But I pay 10% sales tax in Seattle because that's one way that the state and the cities and counties try to make up for the slack of funding for things like education, which we're always behind on. There are also very expensive sin taxes in this area, so alcohol um, and tobacco is highly taxed, so very expensive. But it looks like the 7% capital gains tax might help head us in the right direction. It's It's just because the Democrats were finally able to get a slim majority in both houses of the state legislature, so it passed the Senate um, by one vote, and it's pretty clear that it's going to pass the House and... It won't apply to people's retirement funds or real estate sales or livestock sales for the folks on the east side of the state. So it will only be a small number of people who will actually pay this capital gains tax. They're estimating around 18,000 people. But it will help. You know, it will head us in the right direction. We've also had a lot of really big loopholes um, in terms of lack of luxury taxes in the state for a long time. So those things need to be fixed. And we need to have an equitable tax system that doesn't burden over overburden um, the poor and working folks in this state. It's it's just ridiculous. Well, that's for sure. Hey, I want to take a call from my good friend uh, John in Minneapolis. Uh, like Seattle, a, a city with an educated workforce and again uh, a city council that needs to um, uh, push uh, their mayor and push forward. Uh, on a lot of issues, including the whole Floyd case, which, of course, is uh, front and center with the civil agreement today. Uh, John, you're next with Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santo Show. Uh, any, any thoughts, comments, my friend? Yeah, uh, as far as George Floyd is concerned, I believe that uh, Keith Ellison pushed for a third degree. It went back and forth and back and forth. And this is a very Minnesota way of doing things. You know, you got to play it all out. You know, it, it's kind of theatrical and dramatic, and it's also incredibly, incredibly disgusting as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, um, you know, George Floyd, they had uh, film footage from the time he came into the store. He passed, uh, you know, a counterfeit, you know, 20. I don't know if he even knew that it was counterfeit, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, He was not violent, not a bad person. I knew somebody personally who dated him, and she wouldn't date a badass guy. (laughs) You know, she's a very nice person. Uh, She met him at the uh, Salvation Army uh, homeless shelter in downtown Minneapolis. And, you know, it's, uh, I I mean, we had a black mayor, Sharon Sales Belton, and she was very gung-ho. 
she was moving up in the DSL party. And uh, about 9-11, in fact, they had the primary about 11, and uh, she was uh, essentially not primaried out. They didn't go after her, but they uh, allowed a white man, R.T. Ryback, to just, you know, push her out. After that, you never heard from this woman again. She works for uh, Reuters. She's a writer, you know, and uh, doing quite well with that. But she just turned her back on on politics, and she was a second-generation activist, uh, and she wanted she wanted the police to live here. Yeah. She wanted to reform that police department, and still they have managed not to do that, and I think that the city council is full of young people, and they're not going to back down, and I hope That's good. to God they don't. Yeah, yep. Well, Mar- uh, Mark, uh, it's a big issue, I know, police reform. Uh, you guys had your own problems with the police chief there uh, and so forth. How is that whole issue uh, affecting uh, more protest on, uh, on police uh, reform uh, going on there in Seattle? Yes. Uh, that is not resolved. Uh, still a lot of uh, accusations of systematic racism, um, uh, excessive use of force, all sorts of things. There, we're still battling in the courts over the issue of the crowd control weapons that the Seattle and Portland police love to use on protest. Uh, Mayor Jenny Durkin will not be running. Then there's Colleen Echo Hawk, who is a member of a band of the Pawnee Nation and, and she was actually the first candidate to announce that she's running for mayor. So, I'm, you know, I think it's time for Seattle to have a woman of color as mayor. It's way past time. And I think it's a good sign that people are coming together in the community and demanding more of a progressive a person in the office of the mayor. We have this history here of mayoral candidates running as progressives and then showing their true colors as soon as they get into office. And basically getting in bed with the real estate developers and the large corporations. By the way, in Minneapolis is... 30 is seconds Honeywell so. a large, Okay, I, I have family that lives in that area, so we can talk another time about my experiences with Minneapolis. But So folks could check out my stuff at the Seattle Star, which I highly recommend in daily posts. Um, and thanks, Jeff, once again for a great show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you next Friday. Uh, All the best. Thank you, John, for the great call and comments, as you always bring uh, every time uh, you call the Jeff Santos Show. Mark, uh, enjoy your weekend, my friend. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast, and uh, thank you for listening, folks. Uh, Have yourself a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Keep on fighting, but peacefully. My name is Jeff Santos, and uh, it is my time to say, I gotta go!